technology will help us make better buildings, but some of it is really a sales gimmick, to be honest with you. When people now, one of the big words is sustainability. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in reality, sustainability is only good design. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Robert Oshatz. It's a pleasure meeting you today. Uh, so what I've noticed in your structures, uh, basic design seems to be at play all the time. How challenging is that when, you, when it actually transpires to a livable space? Well, after you do something for years and years, it becomes so much part of your self-conscious that it's not something that you're conscious or thinking about it. You know, what happens really is you, can't, you start with an idea and every, every building has to have an idea, an idea behind it that's a starting point. And you then take that idea and you develop it and you bring it to a logical, uh, logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. And you're designing the structure from the inside and you're working your way out because you want to build a structure that functions exactly the way people want to use the internal spaces for you. You create, it's like a composer creating a symphony. They start with a basic melody and then they build upon it and they have high points and then they have low points, but they're always going back to that particular melody to it. So the architecture gets its own rhythm and harmony. And once you find that, uh, and it's an emotional thought, but subconsciously your mind understands why th that emotional thought came about, uh, a force seems to take over, for me at least, that just starts to tell me what to do, and it's like I'm just following instructions without even thinking, and uh, the building just evolves that way. And when you get to the outside of the structure, since the structure was being designed and planned and section at the same time, the external appearance that you see is just a reflection of the internal interior space. But uh, everything you experience goes into your subconscious and it will come out automatically when it needs to. Right, right that's an amazing thought. Yeah. Uh, just on those lines, uh, you know, when you're talking about basic design, there are a lot of forms that are involved. But today, as we see more and more of uh, the way architecture is involved, you know, evolved, and the way people live, uh, technology plays a big part in, uh, you know, the structures that we have today. Plus, it is also, talk, you know, we're talking about uh, being adaptable to climate, uh, energy efficiency, and all of those factors are almost or sometimes even more important than the, you know, the aesthetics. Uh, do you manage to balance all of that then? Well, uh, you know, one thing is, I think, you know, technology is important and we want to live in our times, not in the past. Right. You know, if you want to live in the past, you're really a drug addict and you're, you're living off of some type of drug or something. We need to take advantage of technology. Technology will help us make better buildings, but some of it is really a sales gimmick, to be honest with you. When people now, one of the big words is sustainability. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in reality, sustainability is only good design. And sustainability was always there. You, you can take any region you can go through in India and the local people built s sustainable structures according to their climate and their s culture. They didn't go thousands of miles away to get materials. They used what was locally available. Well, with technology, we got away from that in the 20th century. And now the big word is sustainability, but it's nothing new. It's something that was there all the time. We forgot about it. And 
in my viewpoint and thinking, you know, it was always there and you just, it was a natural part of design because it was just good design. Yeah, you, you don't impose a design process or your design thoughts upon the client. Uh, so how do you do that? I mean, I would really like our well, audience to hear this. You know, it, it, it's kind of interesting because you can convince the client to go along with the ideas without going through a big effort of trying to educate them and bring them uh, to your way of thinking. Right. But if you show them that they asked for this, this, and this, and I did this, this, and this to get the results you were asking for, then the client will understand why you were doing what you were doing. Uh, the client's not going to understand by you saying that this form requires this and aesthetically this is far more beautiful than that. They're not going to understand those terms when you talk in terms of aesthetic, but they can understand uh, the simple fact that you ask sunlight to hit you in the eyes in the morning when you're getting out of bed, so this is what I did for that to happen. Or you asked me to give you a spot in the morning to have a cup of tea and be able to sit and have the back of my back hit the sun. So this is what I did for that. So you can do all those things. And when you start doing those types of things, you're designing a structure that your client is not adapting to, but is adapted to your client they're going to understand it and they're going to go along with it. What you really you know, want to do is ideally is when the client comes to you and is interviewing you, you're really interviewing that client to see if you're compatible or that you can work together and that it's going to be a nice union because you cannot do a beautiful building without a terrific client. Right. And a terrific client can't do a building with a second-rate architect either. Right. It has to be the right combination together. So in my case, when someone comes to me, and they're interviewing me and I'm interviewing them, I'm seeing and trying to figure out where they want to go with this project. And instead of saying, well, I'm going to change them and move them in this direction when they want to go there, I just look at it and say, where they want to go is it's someplace I want to go also. And if it's someplace I want to go, then it's going to be a beautiful union together and we're going to work in peace. But if I'm going to have to bend them and turn them in a completely different direction, usually it's a losing battle yeah. and you never get there. And uh, some architects will say, well, yes, but if I didn't do it, they would go to somebody else and they'll get something even worse. And my answer is, let them do that. Life is too short. You know, don't ruin your life for them. However, uh, you know, taking it in a slightly different direction from here, uh, I, my personal opinion is many a times the clients also do not know what they want to that last T, you see. and. Uh, isn't it the responsibility then of the architect to kind of guide them and get them there? Well, uh, the client never really knows what they want. Right. It, it's the architect's job to get into the soul of their client to find out what, they re what their dreams and fantasies are. The client really, their experiences, they're not architects, their experience is what they've visually seen or what they've seen in magazines and they usually save magazine <laughs> pictures of their favorite things they saw and they want to show it to you and, and this and that but you know you need to find out do they like soft flowing lines or they like straight lines uh, you know just how they perceive space. You have to understand their budget to know what they can afford to do because most clients can't afford what they you know, really want to do. But what you're doing is you're trying to figure out what their real dreams and fantasies are. And you're trying to uh, you know, understand this. Mm -hmm. And 
just because of your experience, you're going to bring to the project surprise and delight and bring so much more to the project that the client never was able to perceive. He can tell you just certain things, but you have to draw out of that person their emotional thoughts and then translate it for them so that they understand it. Yeah, so I'm curious to know, you must be spending a lot more time with uh, the client. You, you don't get everything in one visit Surely. and you don't finish off everything in the second visit, but as you start working on it, you know, you have your initial idea that comes to mind and when you put it down on the computer or on the paper, you know, it starts, you start having questions in your mind. So, you, you know, you make a phone call to the client and you start talking to them, asking questions about the particular thing that's on your mind at that moment. So you end up having a lot of dialogue going back and forth, but it's not all 100% before you start designing. It's going through, through the process uh, you have that. But the initial design is, you know, you just give them your very best shot. And I always just start by showing them nothing more than the floor plan. So, and I won't let them get out of the floor plan until I know that the floor plan functions exactly the way they want to live and use the structure. You end up, your clients end up becoming your friends because of the number of conversations you have. So that's on the client side. What about the guys who actually work on the structural uh, part or is it always yourself? Because, uh, you know, the, the shapes and forms that you use, uh, it must be a challenge for uh, the structural oh, person for, to for the builder or yes. for the uh, uh, people the are doing the drawings? Who's actually doing the structural drawings, like the engineering drawings. Or well, is that your own? We do it ourselves. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in there. And I usually, uh, very seldom have I had people in there in my studio that are experienced. Uh, I do right now have an experienced person in the studio, but normally I just have interns and I just teach them. And it, it works out very well because uh, you have an experienced person come in and they've worked in different offices and they have in their mind their way of working, but you bring a young intern in, they have no idea, so they just work the way you want to work. <laughs> in there. So, you know, most of the projects, uh, we do very extensive working drawings, right. and, uh, you know, that's where, you know, I'll teach the intern or interns that are in the studio at that time how to do the drawings, and sometimes, we'll do more drawings than we need to do because part of it is a learning exercise for the intern uh, that's in the studio. So God is in the details? Uh, well, you know, they say God's in the details, but so many times uh, what's more important is the essence of the space. Right. And uh, if the essence of the structure is there that it moves you, you can have very simple details and you can have very simple craftsmanship. And uh, I always give the example of the Taj Mahal because to me it's the only building that was started by a builder and finished by a jeweler. So that in this day and age is almost impossible to get. You can't get perfection. You just can't afford something like that normally. So, you know, you design your details and uh, your structure to accept, you know, the quality of craftsmanship that you feel your client's budget can afford. So it's been a pleasure meeting you once again. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with us. Oh, thank you for yeah, having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, so did I. It was really good.